Hey everybody, welcome to the video today. Today I'm going to show you through my process in real time of drawing up a live model. Today's model is going to be my beautiful fiance Avalon. I'll show you her in just a sec. Before I do that, I'm just going to show you a couple of the materials that I use in today's drawing. It's not a lot, so that you can follow along at home. I'll also be speaking periodically throughout the video, not the entire two hours length, but in certain little business sections or maybe just a lot at the start and not so much at the end. But you'll hear me talk over the top of it and I'll explain that when we get to that part. Okay, so before we get into the video, I'll just overview all the materials that I'm going to use for this drawing. Um, so I've got General's Charcoal Pencil. This is an extra soft. Uh, that's pretty much the main workhorse of the whole thing. And then <clears throat> I've got two bits of charcoal. This was a bit longer, <laughs> uh, but they're both just willow sticks. So willow sticks, uh, another important factor, some uh, kneadable eraser. That's another important one of this drawing. And then this sort of like Stedler stick eraser, I suppose you should just call it. A little bit of um, sandpaper there to sharpen out my edges of the charcoals. Um, and then that to just, you know, uh, sharpen up my charcoal pencil. And a little brush here. It's just a finer, softer sort of hog hair, two inch flat brush uh, that I just use to take off some of the, uh, the uh, charcoal. But that's it. Just these things. This is all I use to make the drawing with. And then over here, this is the paper, Ingress the Arches, uh, MBM, 50% cotton. Uh, Parker's, it's a Sydney. Uh, brand it's a Sydney store so it's essentially just cotton laid paper and uh, yeah that's it got the beautiful model here today uh, my incredible fiance Avalon uh, so she'll be uh, modeling for me today and this is what I'll be drawing she's wearing my top here because she she wanted to change the top <laughs> all right anyways let's get into the video all right all right all right let's um get into this so let me just talk about what I'm doing here first and then I'll talk about how the rest of this video is going to roll. So like all of my drawings, if, you, if you've if you watched my uh, charcoal drawing uh, portrait video, you would have you would have heard me uh, talk about how I think about the space of the uh, paper first and I think about the placement of the model first. These are, these are all key uh, first steps that I use and utilize in a... Uh, I, I, essentially a composition at first so my main goal within the first couple of minutes of of, of drawing anything is that I uh, establish where my figure is going to be placed where the head's going to be placed uh, on the piece of paper so that this composition begins to take shape um, you know you, you can do little thumbnails if you want to that, that stuff can help as well but usually I just get stuck into it and I think about the bigger form so you you see I'm making marks where the top of Av's head is and where the bottom of her jaw is. Then I start to sort of round out the shape a little bit so I can get a sense of uh, the thickness of Av's skull here. And then and then I start to place in pieces and, uh, of the hair and, you know, and, and then I start to get a bit more refined. And that, that's the general process is starting big and then getting to refinement, but taking my time with it. So to give you an overview of what's going to happen throughout this video, I'm just going to be talking majority of this video about my process and what's happening before you and why I'm doing such things and, and uh, you know, techniques and, and what I've learned from uh, my past drawings and uh, things I think would be really useful to know. So I'll be just talking majority of the video. So, um, But if you don't want to hear me uh, ramble on, feel free to put this on two times and listen to some music in the background. <laughs> So to look at how I'm going now, you you can kind of see the gist of what I'm doing. It's just really laying out the shapes 
and the foundations of what I'm going to build upon. These, this is re- the real scaffolding type of section. You know, I'm not thinking about anything other than the shapes and anything other than how the general bigger picture compositionally looks. Um, I've only got 30 minutes here with Av because <laughs> she's pregnant. Bob doesn't really like to uh, let her sit, sit still for too long. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want Av to be sitting dead still for two hours straight. Like, that'd be very uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. You know, you can take breaks and stuff, but it was just easier to sit with Av for 30 minutes and get as much as I can and work as quickly as I can. Uh, and get it to stay as, as still as she can and I just snap a quick photo uh, of her in that position that I can work from. Uh, you know, I, I I mean, you can... It doesn't really make a huge difference whether you work from a good photo or not. <laughs> um, you know, I say good photo because, you, you know, you can't really work from shitty photos and, and there's some things you got to... Vo- you definitely got to try and avoid. <laughs> um but yeah, working from life it is honestly the, it's the best thing. Obviously, that's why I try to get as much uh, of it as I can. And um, but having the having the photo there, it's just it's just practicality, really. And um, you know, I've you know I don't want her to sit for as long as uh, need be. And I'm really thankful for the time that she gives me uh, for sitting. Anyways, <laughs> what little it may be. But yeah. Generally, when I'm building this drawing, you can see that my shapes are just th- literally that. They're shapes. There are uh, circles and, and squares and triangles, and then I start to get like smaller circles, smaller sh- squares, smaller triangles, and stuff of that nature. And uh, and then after I've started putting in that, I start to refine maybe a little bit of key features here and there. And uh, what I'll put down next is maybe a little bit of shading, you know, put down a little bit of value on top of that drawing. Um, Having that value there really kind of just helps me uh, work up the drawing. And and working up the drawing is is pretty much the whole process. It's just taking your time with it and working it slowly and incrementally. A lot of this drawing process is is really just, you know, I think ninety percent of my mark making is is uh, imaginary mark making, and what I mean by that is you'll see me throughout the drawing make marks where I'm not really making any marks. I'm just above the paper and I'm visualizing the mark I'm about to make. That that's some that's a I guess that's just something I've always done. It's it's a trick that I've. I've not really a trick. It's a technique that that I've I've just naturally started to do. Um, it is over the years of, of drawing. Is just these imaginary mark making, visualizing my lines, visualizing the the mark I'm about to put down, because it it helps. It really helps if you just if you're above the paper, you swing a couple times, like practice swings, and then you make the mark. You know, it's it saves you time from like rubbing out things, and you get you get the rhythm there before you make that mark. Um, it, it I don't <laughs> really know where I learned it from. I think it's just something I've just I I think I've just instinctively just started to do it. I don't know if anybody else does it. I don't know if if I saw it somewhere and just thought that's a great idea. <laughs> I just think it's just something that I've I, I've always done. You know, when I've approached drawing, is that visualization of the mark. And it really helps. It really helps. It really helps having that, those first couple of practice swings above the paper and then, boom, making that mark. You know, you'll see me, I won't use it all the time, um, but it, it's there throughout the thing, throughout the uh, process for sure. I just thought that's interesting to talk about.
Now you can kind of see that I'm starting to put in some like some darker lines. They're not really dark as of yet, but you can see that the whole idea is that I'm building up the uh, the thickness and the darkness of my uh, my tones. Uh, you can see here in these eyes that the uh, the the eyes are starting to get a bit darker and the hair around is starting to get a bit darker. That's the general process. I I start really light. You know, really not so much pressure on the uh, paper at all with the charcoal so that I can take it off and I can uh, remove that charcoal if I need to be. And I can work it a lot easier than, say, if I put down a real heavy mark. This, that's something I talked about in my portrait drawing video from uh, the other week. Uh, so you can go back and watch that. Hopefully you get... Uh, if you watch that, honestly, you'll probably you watch that first and then come back to this video and you, you you can see what I'm talking about all in real time. So that might be something helpful to do. And you can see here that it really helps having that um th those light marks so that I can just you know I can sit back a little bit off of it and think hmm, that's that's not right and just completely pull it off the paper uh it's, it you know it saves so many nightmares really here you know I think I'm feeling confident in in the shapes in everything of that nature I I feel uh, confident that I can put in some sort of background now. Now this background, you know, not only helps the composition, not only helps like the piece look good aesthetically in general, but it, it really helps me in the process. It, it really helps me see the shapes. It helps me uh, work the modeling of, of the figure, of the shapes, and, and really helps me define the tones. Because with the background, I can put in essentially my darkest darks, you know, pretty much right away. And I've got something to work towards in terms of building up to to that dark, you know. And I can see what's really light and what's really dark. And uh, that's that's something that's just really helpful, you know. Even just putting in, you don't have to go str super dark straight away. Like I, you can see here that I haven't gone super dark straight away. I've kind of held off and put in some just light uh, charcoals, um, scratches down the uh, paper there, just smudged over the top of the paper. Um, it, so it can just be something light there. It can just, all it does is just help me tell my values and um, just helps me along the process. Because it is, it's just a slow process that you've got to be really patient with and just build it up, build it up and build it up, you know. You, you, you can, you know, eventually, you know, people talk about Sargent in his drawings that he, he was like a maniac when he drew, apparently. <laughs> he, he was, he was very uh, speedy, I suppose. But um, in his letters, he talked about um, only doing two to three hour sessions of, of his charcoal drawings. And that was a reason why he went to the charcoal drawings anyways, because he was sick of <laughs> the long hours put into um, portraiture and he was sick of um, the people that would commission the portraiture as well. <laughs> so yeah, so really the whole point of saying that is it, it is a two to three hour process, generally speaking. You know, you can go, obviously, you can put like a good hundred hours into the into the drawing if you want to. Um I don't necessarily think either or is better than the other. Uh, I just generally find that I'm I'm really happy with my drawings at around the two to three hour mark, similar to what Sergeant was and similar to how Sergeant drew. Um, I just it I just really I don't I don't aspire for the heavily rendered out uh, aesthetics. I uh, I kind of aspire for <laughs> it's funny a more painterly aesthetic i suppose in a way it is my aspiration is that that's that's my goal that's my my aim in my drawings is it's it's more you know i'm really trying to capture the essence of the sitter i'm not you know if i wanted to 
literally capture the sitter. I'll take a photo. What I'm doing is different. What I'm doing is more meaningful. It's a bit more deeper than than just just pure and simple realism. It, it's you know I'm putting a lot of myself into the drawing in terms of where I'm placing lines, where I'm doing values. All of the above, you know, I'm really considering where everything's going. I'm not just one for one cop copying, obviously, because you'll see later on this in this uh, drawing, Av doesn't have these big swooshy sort of lines going through her hair at all, you know, or going down her shirt or anything like that. Uh, those are just ideas and, and, and aesthetics that I've chosen to utilize so that the drawing and the way that it reads, reads nice and reads really well. You can see I've, I've started to put in the background here, putting in these darker tones there so that I can, it really just helps me so that I can start to work into the figure, these dark tones too. And so that I, I have this sort of base understanding of, okay, so this here, my background, that's, that's, that's as black as I can go. That's, that's the black right there obviously i can i can take my brush and brush off that charcoal uh quite significantly and and take it back uh, a couple of stops of value um but you know i'm putting that in there so that i've got an idea of like okay so that's my value range you know i've got the white of the paper i've got the darkest like pushed in bit of the charcoal uh, it just it, it just helps my mind it just creates clarity and creating clarity in your drawing instead of a whole bunch of unnecessary noise and lines and scribbles, you know, is just, if anybody that's drawn a lot, you'll understand. It's just, it, if you if you just keep working and drawing and you just got a whole bunch of lines and scribbles that you don't really understand, there's no method to the madness, you, you get real sick of it real quickly and, you know, you kind of just lose yourself in the in the whole process. So have a method to it. And this is my method, is putting in those darks and, and, and bouncing off of them. So now I'm becoming a lot more braver with my marks. I'm becoming, uh, I, it's funny, braver, I suppose, but it's more calculated, I suppose, is a better word for it. I'm starting to really push those darks of the hair there. I'm looking at where those marks sit, how those marks look, uh, what can I bring to it, what can I take away from it, and uh, of course working that background again as well. Oh, so this is interesting. This is the first time I pulled out the uh, brush. What this does is really helpful actually. Um, it, it, it can take away a lot of the charcoal, but um, leave the tone onto the paper. And that's something really helpful because you you don't always want... See how I'm putting in these thick charcoal lines? I don't always want those thick charcoal lines because what I want from those thick charcoal lines is to utilize them to bring Avalon's form and, and deploy them into the to the reading method of the drawing more so than the, than the just filling in space. And so what you can do is I can pull out that brush and brush them back but leave that tonal value well, close to it because you'll take it off a few stops, obviously. But I'll, I'll leave that tonal value on that paper so that when I put in those dark marks on her hair, you can see them a lot easier. Because look at that. I can, I can put down just a stroke in the hair there. Compare that to those dark um, scratches downwards to the lifted off um, charcoal with the... Uh, brush next to it, uh, blow it rather, you can really see those marks on the hair a lot easier than you can with those charcoal marks down. So it works aesthetically as well and helps me tell what I want to tell to, to the reader, to the viewer, whoever's looking at the piece that this is what's important, this is what's not important, this can get lost here, I can take that off here, these marks is what's going to help you read this portrait. And so this is why I put them there. It's stuff of that nature, you know, there's just, it's just stuff that you learn uh, over the course of, of, of drawing uh, heaps, <laughs> lots and lots of drawing. <coughs> and, 
And and in fact, you know, if you if you look at a lot of Sargent's drawings, I'm sorry to bring up Sargent so much, but like uh, he's literally the person that I've been studying uh, of late is, is a lot of his charcoal drawings. In fact, I got the book. I talked about that in uh, in a previous video. Is that um, John Singer Sargent uh, portraits in charcoal book? It's a it's a pretty recent book, 2019 release. Um, so I've been studying a lot of those drawings in there and deconstructing them, reconstructing them. Um, and what I find is that he has obviously lifted a lot of charcoal off with a brush. It, in the book, it talks that he used to work with bread, surprisingly enough. Bread of all things. Apparently, people used uh, ha to have letters of, of his, some of his sitters and they would talk that while he was drawing, he said, oh, this is too cloudy. And he'd reach for a loaf of bread that he'd have with him for the drawings. And he'd he'd use little bits of the bread to take off the charcoal. Apparently, it was just great to take off charcoal. I've never tried using a loaf of bread to take off charcoal with before. But, you know, apparently, it's, it's great stuff. So, char point being is that Sergeant has lifted off similar to what I've been, I'm doing here because I've learned it from him with the uh, brush is lifting off that charcoal allowing that that f that uh, flatter tone value to stay there so that i can make those marks more prominent um but yeah it just thought it was something funny and interesting to to mention there and he used to use bread <laughs> for his uh charcoal drawings I think something that's really interesting about this whole process is is being able to to see, you know, a lot of the time we we only see paintings sped up in a time lapse of some sort, so or, or cut up into into pieces, and we we see little periodic like excerpts of of the of the process. And so you kind of get this sense that there's this mad, you unconsciously, I suppose, you get this mad sense that there's this mad rush and, and um, deliberation in the drawing. When really, you know, watching my drawing process, just even up to this point here, is it's a lot of just slow, calculated thinking about the next move, looking at Av looking at how she's looking, looking at what I want to put in, looking at what I think would suit the drawing, you know, how I could capture her essence in the drawing better. You know, it, there's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of uh, pause, a lot of time to think about the marks that I'm about to make and uh, a, lot of, a lot of time allocated to slowly building up the form, you know. And so we can kind of, you know, catch ourselves up and, and sort of, uh, uh, not intentionally, tr we sort of trick ourselves into thinking that, well, if my drawing isn't, isn't pumped through in like an hour and it's not looking any good, it's, you know, I'm nowhere near as good as such and such, you know, which in, in fact is not the case. It's just because that's all we, we kind of see in today's age of just quick, instantaneous gratification of, of of a 15 second video that we saw on Instagram of somebody painting <laughs> you know so I you know this is kind of more more so for the uh, younger audience here which I know a lot of a lot of them a lot of people here are is that you know the a drawing in the process is a lot of thinking is a lot of Putting down a mark, thinking, okay, was that a good place to put that? No, okay, I'll take that off. Yes, I'll leave it. Move on to the next thing. You know, lots of thinking, lots of uh, checking, checking, rechecking, and then making a mark. <laughs> you know, so don't get, don't get. Um, the whole point of this being, just don't, don't really get blown up at yourself. You know, if you, if you're taking time with your drawing, if the, if your drawing takes days if your drawing takes a couple a couple of weeks you know you, you do a little bit of it 
put it, put the pencil down, come back to it tomorrow, something like that. You know, don't blow up at yourself. You know, just because it didn't take two hours or three hours, like Zach Hampson said, he liked to draw his portraits in. You know, <laughs> you know, just just work at your own pace and be happy with your own pace, and know that you know the process of learning is a long one, and the more the the fact that I'm that you're just putting in. Uh, time into the process means so much more than if you weren't drawing at all so be proud of the fact that you are putting in time to the process if you are (laughs) if you're not put in time (laughs) so now you can kind of see how that background is really is kind of really helping me what you you know where in the beginning the eyes look like the darkest part of the portrait thus far. Now it's the background, now it's the marks in the hair and and everything of that nature. You know, it's so that background putting in is just oh my god dude, it's such it's such a lifesaver really a, a, in the whole process. It helps tremendously. It's so it's so great to have that. It's just such a great tool to utilize in, in terms of understanding what your darkest mark really is. You can't, you'll probably see me blow on the charcoal um, quite a bit throughout the process. It's just it's just a <laughs> it's just a helpful thing to do because it takes off a lot of the loose charcoal off the page. Um, it you know having that loose charcoal on the page not only sort of deceives you with what the values really are, but also can be prone to the smudging and, and sort of you, you'll put down a mark and you're carrying some charcoal that's already on the page through that mark and it's like a thicker mark than what you wanted it to be because that loose charcoal's on the page. So, uh, and and blowing on the, uh, blowing off all that loose charcoal doesn't actually take off the marks like what utilizing the brush does. It, it just kind of just, um, takes it takes all off that excess so that you can see what that real mark uh, looks like underneath so if you see me blowing on the ch- blowing off the charcoal uh, through this uh, drawing process um, know that that's what's happening here I'm just taking it off and you know seeing what that mark really looks like so that's something you can probably you know take away to your own practices Another thing you'll probably notice that I'm not going to put in any definite, definitive lines in Avalon's face until about an hour, maybe an hour and a half into the whole drawing process. It's because I'm taking my time and slowly building up the forms of her facial features and her face in general. That that slow build um, up to up to the uh, final marks uh, makes it a, a world of difference. Really, that's something I've learned uh, as of late as well. Studying char- uh, Sergeant's drawings, and and just because I've been drawing for so long too, is is that fact of the slow build, and then okay, so what do I want to define here in the eye? I'll make that a prominent mark, and you'll see that at the end of the drawing. I talk about that as well, but. Yeah, that slow build, it, it, I can't stress that enough. Slowly building up the drawing um, and then putting in your final mark making, especially on the face, especially if it's a portrait drawing, especially on the facial features like the eyes and, and the nose and lips and the eyebrows. Um, it's very important that we, we build it up slowly and, you know, we do we, we can we can fully get some real real value into it, of course. But putting in those final definite black marks is um, we're only going to put those in at the very end. You know, well, when we feel strong, keen enough and strong enough of the, of the, of the um, drawing that, okay, I can put in some r- real strong marks now um, here, here and there. So yeah, build up slowly and leave those really thick definite marks for last when you're really confident in the uh, structure of the drawing in the placement of the eyes and everything because you know a lot of the times 
when we're in the process of drawing. It's not until we start to get a lot of other things into the drawing is when we start to see the faults in other areas of the drawing. So that's kind of the way I work. I, I don't work on one particular section at a time. I work all, <laughs> you'll see it throughout this video. I work all over the drawing. I jump from the face to the hair, to the ears, to the background, to the to the shirt, to her neck, to to the lips, to the back to the forehead, back to the hair, back to the background. I jump all over the place because I know that if I worked one area, I'm not going to see if this is if this is going correctly or not. And it's only when I started putting in other areas of the drawing is when I start to really see how the drawing as a whole is coming into coming into fruition. So that's something to really think about. Work the entire drawing uh, all at once, <laughs> you know, and don't focus on one particular area. Really work the drawing as a whole and then keep working it as a whole until it's finished. That's that. Well, at least that's my method, you know, and I find that that method really helps because you can compare those those different areas to each other and see if they're they're good to go or not. So here um, is just about time that uh, I promised Av I would take from her <laughs> the the thirty minute mark. So I take my photo and it's just a nice high quality photo off of my um, main working horse camera, the Sony camera that I have that I photograph like my works with and stuff of that nature. So I take a really good high quality photo of her in that position. I expose for it correctly. And that's something that I can use to uh, draw from uh, going through in this video. So using a photo, you know, you'll often, if you're in the arts and you do art and you in art society or in general or have anything uh, of a sort of interest in the arts you'll hear the uh, the common argument oh using the photo is just uh, it's just it's just plain cheating you know you're not really uh, a painter and, uh, you know and I've, I've had ridiculous people uh, message me out of nowhere telling me that it, you know um, they're like oh I had this one guy message me on Instagram one time and he he just I don't know what his deal was. He was just some weird dude, like weird older artist dude from like America somewhere. He's like he's like uh, nice drawings, except uh, the one fact that you should be working from life at all times. And, he's, and he tried. He went on this big spiel about working from life, and and he's like, good luck with the rest of your art, buddy, and all this stuff. And I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> Obviously, I didn't reply. I just blocked this fucking loser. Um, but you get people like that. That's the point is that these people just don't realize that the great artists throughout the ages since the dawn of photography have seen the tool and the usefulness in photography and have implemented it into their art. Soroya is a great case. He would take photographs of, of scenes and, and setups that he would that he would construct, obviously, and, uh, especially on boats and stuff of that nature. Um, he would create scenes with, with these uh, uh, quote-unquote models. They weren't models, they were real people. Um, but with the, with the people there, he would, he would create a scene with them and, and snap a photo with them of them and, and do a painting as well, uh, especially if he was going to take it back to his studio or do something of that nature. Uh, um, he would u utilize photography as well. Um, so Roya definitely used it, Sargent used it, um, uh, name an artist, uh, after the invention of photography and I will probably, you'll probably be able to find that they use photography. Um, so photography is a fantastic and an incredible tool for artists to utilize as a tool. Um, the point being is, uh, that there is a strong case and a very evident case um, with the way of studying and drawing and painting from photos. Uh, they, they are tools and they are to be used as such, but they're never to be relied upon as be all end all. Um, simply because the way that a camera interprets things is, the way that it interprets it, it, it sees it through a lens and then we're seeing that through another lens and then that ends up inevitably on a screen all of which flattens the image uh, very, very much. So it's flattened very, 
like significantly and the whole image is flattened and the way that the camera sees it is the way that it's showing us it might not necessarily be the way that our eyes would see that such thing um so distortion and flattening of the image it plays a big part uh so that's something you definitely got to be aware of when utilizing a photo uh and so the the point being is that when we work from life we're able to see things as a whole with our actual eyes that can perceive things greater than what a camera can do and so obviously having a life and having our eyes that's the, that provides us with the greatest uh reference that we could possibly have so having the greatest reference means that you know there's that's one less less annoyance that we have to deal with in terms of getting better and progressing with our art so working from life is definitely optimal um but in saying that you know you don't have to work from life entirely like i am doing now i obviously only had 30 minutes with av i said look babe can we just can i just do 30 minutes i know you don't like to sit still especially because you're pregnant um let's just do 30 can i do 30 minutes and then i'll take a good photo and uh, work off of that for the rest of the portrait she's like yep yeah, sure that sounds great so obviously you're going to get sitters that you know may be pregnant you know might be a bit older might be a bit younger even you know and might not like to sit still <laughs> and so in that case work what you can to whatever degree that might may be even if it's only a little bit you know capture what you can in in the present in our life um, that goes a long way. It really it goes such a long way if you can capture whatever you can while you're there in the moment with the with the sitter with the with the um, commissioner commissionee or or a patron or or the sitter or the model whatever. Capture what you can and then take a high quality photo if you if you need to uh, finish it back at home. Take a expose for both the darks and the lights. Uh, work that together in Photoshop um, or in the Lightroom, you know, because uh, the camera sees darks as literal darks and won't give give you much information for that. So expose for both the darks and the lights, and then in Photoshop we can sort of HDR them together, and then in Lightroom we can fix them up, and so we get a really great exposed photo of of what we uh, would have been there in in the present. Uh, that's some stuff you can learn on YouTube. That's what I learn on YouTube, anyways. Is how to expose uh, for a portrait, uh, photo stuff like of that nature. People will teach that uh, left, right, and center on YouTube if you just look for that. So that's what you do. You take a really nice, high quality photo, and take that back to the studio with you, uh, like I'm doing now, and be able to work that uh, with your image. And uh, it, you know, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic tool, and it should be utilized as a tool. Um, and but the argument of of oh the photos are just cheating stuff is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. There's, you know, as artists, we should be looking at any way to get the upper hand that we possibly can. And what whatever gets us to a beautifully, uh, like a beautiful creation that started at first in our mind and now ends up in front of us uh, faster and easier and more effectively uh, is something that we should be looking for, looking at. You know. Uh, maybe not faster, but the rest is <laughs> something we should definitely not count out. And, you know, photography is definitely one of those things. Sorry for a bit of a spiel there, but um, it was definitely uh, worthwhile, especially because I know I have a bit of a younger um, audience um, coming from like Instagram and stuff of that nature that people, you know, are generally just starting out uh, with their artistic career. I say younger, but I just really just mean. Uh, people that are new to the arts and new to learning uh, creativity and, and, and drawing and painting of that nature. So that being said, don't let people tell you not to use photographs because you certainly can use them as a tool. <laughs> but anyways, back to what I'm doing here. You can see that I've constru I'm have i sort of constructing the background around Avalon's head and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of able to use a background to reshape her head, in a way, well, especially her hair more, more rather. I'm able to utilize that background to shape the, the shape of her hair, hair into a, a shape that I, I, I like a lot more. And uh, I've, I've started to lay on a lot more charcoal. You can see that yeah, having a lot more charcoal, especially for things like hair and stuff of that nature, just it means it allows you to sort of have a more looser, flowy, more uh, richer sort of tonal range uh, when it comes to um, 
rendering out the hair bits because then we can come in with the eraser and stuff of that nature and and pull sort of strands of hair into the hair which you'll see me do later on in this video So you can see that I've become a lot more uh, confident with my mark making, um, especially in the hair. Uh, I'm definitely going to hold off on that confidence on the face for a little while longer. The face, like I said in the beginning uh, earlier, is something I generally leave to last when making definite marks or is something I leave to later in the process when making definite marks when I've worked out all my other tonal values and stuff of that nature. So working around the face and working that hair, working that more confident mark making, I'm starting to really figure out, okay, what sort of line values and, and stuff of that nature do I want to uh, emphasize and what do I want to put on? What do I want to take away from, from this drawing, from this portrait? What can help the portrait and what can't and what's just a waste of time? So those are questions that I'm constantly asking myself when I'm uh, doing this sort of uh, thing. Uh, so you see, I'm just making a mark there underneath the um, the collar of the shirt and think, oh, okay, yeah, that, that definitely helps sort of define the collar sort of aspect of the shirt. Uh, that's something really, really helpful. If you If you see, just to mention, just real quick, uh, if you see me, if you see the camera sort of cut, that's in no way cutting out like any of the real-time process I'm not trying to like uh, uh, trick you in any way of that nature what I'm just doing is like I've obviously just uh, either put the pencil down to go eat or go to the toilet stuff something like that I've put the pencil down so I'm just cutting out periods of time if you see the camera do it does jump I've either just moved the camera uh, try to get a better angle or I'm just cutting out periods of time where I've put the pencils down completely and gone and done something else and come back Usually it's like about like a five minute period that I've just cut out because I don't want you to sit here <laughs> and watch a piece of paper just sit there and nothing happen. <laughs> so in order to uh, uh, the the flow of the video to be consistent, I've cut out those periods of time where I'm not at the holding the pencils. <laughs> just just so you're aware, so that you don't think I'm just skipping it forward in time for no reason. This is definitely a real time video. With my with my pencil, uh, I like to sort of use the pencil more for a slow, gradual build up of charcoal. Um, it's just a lot more controllable than with, say, the willow sticks. Um, it's it's extra soft. It's an extra soft charcoal pencil, but it's it's it says extra soft, but it's definitely not as soft as a willow stick or, or something like that. Um, just by feeling it out and how that feels in my hand, it's definitely not as soft as that because I can I can I can push a lot harder with it and it's, it's still gradually build up on value with it. As you can see, I'm doing here in the uh, and on the neck part here, I'm trying to build up some value over the top there. It just allows for a bit more control uh, when I'm working like features that I don't want to be heavy with charcoal uh, that I don't want to um, have a lot of tone go down all at once because I know I won't be able to pick it all off again. It'll be much darker than what I would like it to be. It just allows a lot more control. And so using the pencil uh, for things of that nature um, is a really great idea and I really recommend it. Um, so if you're looking to build up your tone slowly, pick up the pencil and just slowly build it up with like some cross hatching stuff of that nature or just some slow rendering sort of um, of the uh, forms that I'm trying to put in place obviously with the hair and stuff of that nature going into it now I want more charcoal and I want more uh, value onto it so that I can manipulate it with the eraser later um, so putting down uh, heavy amounts of charcoal onto the hair um, is something really helpful like I'm doing right now So you can see I've got that eraser there and I was able to pull off some of that charcoal at the back of the hair there 
and you can see how much of a difference that makes. I'm able to sort of pull that down and sort of get this flow type of rhythm into the hair that the hair, that just hair naturally has because it's not just one solid object. Um, of course, we started off as a solid object, as a solid shape, but um, inevitably it, we, we need to translate that into, oh, this is hair. And so having that charcoal down and being able to manipulate that with the eraser is something that gets us to that point. And again, another great example of just building up slowly and not putting down hard marks on the face. Because when I go to recheck things, uh, I can notice that, oh, that's not completely where I want it to be. I'll just pull that off with the uh, eraser there and come back into it. So that's just so something to, you know, another great example of like, especially on the face, when we're doing a portrait, build slowly, build softly, and uh, just change, change, change the whole way through. Like, the whole portrait is going to go through so many changes before you finish. And it should go through so many changes before you finish. If you aren't going through any changes and you're just sticking with exactly what you've put down on the first stroke, I'd call you a goddamn genius. <laughs> or inhuman. Or, or, just a, or just a human printer. <laughs> because that's just insane. We, you know, we just have to go through the motions, you know, regular folk, I'll say that I'm sure there's people out there that can just put down, put down and just, it looks fantastic. I'm sure people like that exist, but regular folk <laughs> need to um, build slowly and build um, precisely and, and, and make changes. And, you know, it's, it's not, it's nothing wrong with making a change if you, if you realize that it's wrong. The only wrong part would be to see the change and be like, oh, I can't be bothered. I'll just leave that. Nobody will notice. Oh, that's a slippery soap. And, you know, you don't progress when you when you notice the incorrect parts of your portrait and the incorrect parts of your drawings and the incorrect parts of your paintings and you choose to ignore them. You just do not progress. And that's something that we've got to be on top of ourselves with as artists is, is that we need to realize when something's going wrong okay check and then change it check do not ignore it <laughs> just out of laziness or out of usually it's just out of laziness i can't really think at the moment what else it would be for except for laziness <laughs> but when you see the problem get on top of it and change it now because when the portrait is four hours five hours deep it's going to be a lot harder to change that that wonky looking eye if that eye is three centimeters lower than the eye next to it. It's going to look whack and you're going to suffer for it because you're going to have to redo the entire portrait from scratch rather than just taking a couple of seconds when you noticed that the eye was lower in the early stages and erase it and bring it up. You know, I can't stress that enough. Because I noticed that in myself when I do, when I when I uh, um, first started drawing and stuff of that nature, um, and even you know today sometimes I'm just like oh you know I can't be bothered, but um, I always I always bring myself to change it you know <laughs> I listen to my own advice don't you worry but um, in in the past when I was first starting to um, draw uh, consistently and a lot. I'd notice that I would put one eye lower than the other. For I don't I don't really know why I would do such a thing. It was just something that I I found myself doing is that one eye would be lower than the other, or one eye would be higher than the other, and it wasn't because the sitter was uh, had their head tilted or anything of that nature. It was just I don't know what it was. It's just and I just did it i just i don't know why it's just something i did in my drawings <laughs> i can't explain it but um yeah and that was something that i i could only you know get better at correcting by taking the time out to be like oh, that fucking eye again again i gotta change that again again and i gotta change that you know it, was, it obviously would have been easier to just be like oh whatever and just you know just been like i'll get better the next portrait or whatever 
it, you know, that I guess that would have been the immediate easiest path, but the long term hardest path because I'm just building a habit inside of myself to be like, oh, that's just a mistake, whatever, and I'll, I'll do better next time. Instead of being like, no, 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 that's a mistake, I will do better now and implement that change now and implement the habit of getting on top of those things that are incorrect in our portraits, in our, in our drawings, in our paintings now so that the painting now will be better now <laughs> rather than the painting sometime in the future that I'm going to make is going to be better for me ignoring my mistakes now. It, that never works and it never works out well. If it's ever worked out well, I'd be very surprised and I'm willing to bet that it never has. <laughs> um, so you can see I'm starting to get a lot more confident in the uh, shading, the shades and the values of my um, of Avalon's face uh, and particularly her neck here. Um, the way that I'm building it up is like I'm, I'm checking to see those values around the face first, then I'm like to say the neck and, and the hair and the background and, and the collar. And then I'm going into the neck and I'm building that up more and more. And I'm like, okay, I'm liking that value range. And then I'll go into things like the um, the forehead, the cheeks, uh, sometimes the lips like I'm doing now. And I'll, I'll try and work those out a bit more because they're more of the darker areas. Obviously, the eyes and the, and the eyebrows will be darker features too. But I generally leave them a bit, a bit last when I'm really confident about that because... Uh, especially in portraits where we are able to tell where things are um, what we're able to tell somebody's characteristics we're able to recognize somebody the most through their eyes and and, and through that sort of brow line eye line uh, section of the face is where we have that recognizing uh, capabilities the most most prominently uh, face shape uh, is the second I think and like then nose and ears and mouth uh, after the face shape um, so that all comes that's like a big thing so obviously I put priority tries I, I prioritize all the shapes uh, first that's the first thing I'm doing I'm constantly w reworking the shapes and the values in the shapes um, but yeah the eye, eye line and brow when I'm most confident when I've worked out everything else uh, I'll put them in uh, semi lost. That's a fun fact, actually, is that uh, I can't remember where I learned it from, but somebody was telling me a long time ago about how we evolved to see the smallest movements in people's irises because we could see uh, what they were focused on. And, and, and they were explaining to me how that was such a uh, crucial part in, in our development is being able to notice when people are looking at us or what they're looking at um i can't off the top of my head right now i can't remember exactly why that was helpful but it was something interesting to to uh that just came to my mind as i was talking about that <laughs> so i'm in with this the willow stick there and i'm starting to really bring in some of these um darker features especially around avalon's face here that's really going to emphasize the tonal range that my final marks will hit and the tonal range that my shadows and that will, uh, you know, not go up towards because they'll be the darkest dark, but go semi towards. Uh, it just really helped me um, understand the way that my uh, tones will sit on, on Avalon's face a lot more when I'm putting in these marks around the face. You can see I'm constantly sort of pulling off charcoal from this background to emphasize more marks of the hair. Uh, that's, that's something, you know, the background so helpful for is that, you know, I wasn't completely happy with the shape of her hair there, so I can just brush it off. Obviously, you can see that I still got that charcoal sort of s sitting there that's ingrained in the paper that I can't get rid of, but that's fine. That's, you know, I want that. I want that sort of thing. So, it, but... I just want to reshape that sort of hair in that nature. Coming in with the pencil, um, is the, the pencil you kind of think of, of your um, utility knife, I suppose, if we're talking survival. <laughs> um, it, it's your uh, 
be all end all sort of utility knife that uh does everything you know it can it can build up shapes and build up shadows it can you can work the tip of it to get those more final lines in with it um and so that's how i use my pencil i i use it for a utility sort of <laughs> purposes um because you can see i'm building up tone with it i'm building up lines with it um everything of that nature so when thinking about the pencil i think about that as a utility knife Like I said earlier, a lot of my mark making happens above the paper, not on the paper. <laughs> um, so that imaginary mark making, like I said earlier, you can see that when I'm looking at the jaw there, I'm, I'm thinking about, okay, I want to make that mark. I want to make that mark. I'm visualizing, I'm practicing above the paper and I make the mark, you know. So that's just something you're going to see me constantly do. I said that earlier. I know I won't touch on it more than I already have, but... Just remember that. Just remember that visualization above the paper when you want to go make a mark, you know, really, really helps being able to nail that mark so that we don't have this chicken scratching type of mark making, which never looks good. It looks uh, inconsistent and it looks uh, um, just a bit nervous, a bit um, not, not confident, really. And we want to have confident mark making. Another thing I, I think would be good to bring up is the fact that knowing the marks which your tools make is, is something that can really help you. And so I know kind of intuitively now that if I make my needable eraser and if I, if I push it into a certain shape, I know what sort of mark it's going to make uh, and I know the way to hold it to get that mark that I want it to make. And uh, same way in terms of like my other erasers, the, the, the normal ones, the harder type of ones, that if I cut it a certain way with my, with my knife, uh, I can make it have a sort of a hard edge. And so I can bring that into the drawing for nice highlights. Um, and same way with if I can look at my charcoal sticks and I can see that one side's worn down, that's going to give me a wider mark than the other side that's a bit more pointed. So be familiar with the shapes that your tools can make. Uh, and, and, you know, don't, you know, I, saying this is because I, I've heard and seen people that sort of go around and go, oh, what do you use? Okay, I use that. Oh, what does that artist use? Oh, I'll use that. Okay. Uh, what does that artist use? Oh, okay, I'll use that as well. And they have this, this, this utility belt of just, everything under the sun that you could use to 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 draw with uh, great it's handy but but because 
you're not that artist and you don't know the way in which they use those tools, they, they're pretty much useless to you. Uh, and so in saying that, familiarize yourself with a set of tools that you know inside and out and able to draw upon out of your, out of your tool belt and, and utilize uh, knowing exactly how to utilize them and situations that come up and when to utilize them for those situations that come up. So point being is get a consistent set of tools that you use regularly for your drawings and use them regularly for your drawings, you know, and let them become the be all end all tools that you use for your drawings. When other things come along and you think, oh, that would improve my drawings like my tools uh and i can add that into my utility belt but add them in slowly add them one by one like i do that's what i've done over time is i i start with just generals uh oh actually no i started with when i went into charcoal i started with just willow sticks i started with general willow sticks that and the thin ones too so i started with them and then I went and got some general charcoal pencils and started with a soft and went to extra soft, went to medium, then went to hard with that and familiarized myself with the way that each one of those worked and moved because they work and move very differently from each other. And especially the pencils in general move a lot differently than the willow sticks of charcoal. And so the familiarity between those things and, and the time I've spent with all of them individually uh, allows me to be like, okay, I know how these all work. Let me let me see. Okay, I, I might need a bigger charcoal stick to get some more ground. And so I get a bigger willow stick. And so I already know how willow sticks work and stuff of that nature because it's already in my tool belt. So I can just bring that on, on board. And then, you know, obviously my needable eraser was always there so I know how that works and stuff of that nature and then I start to bring in some harder erasers that I can cut and shape with a knife and to get these specific harder lines into my drawings and stuff so they come along and then uh, eventually I guess the newest addition would be using uh, a brush that that two inch uh, hog hair sort of bristle brush that you see me pull out every now and again to brush away that background or brush away some charcoal. That is the newest addition, I suppose, um, talking timeline wise, but I've been using it for the last maybe eight months. So it's new, but in terms of life, I guess not that new. <laughs> but in saying that, it I didn't immediately reach out and grab that into my tool belt because I, I, I would have seen people use it in the past, but I wouldn't have known how to use it had I not been familiar with the tools in my tool belt, had I not been familiar with the way that my charcoal moves on the paper, with the way that my pencils move on the paper and stuff of that nature. And I, so I wouldn't be been able to use it effectively. Uh, so that's a really big thing is knowing the tools in your belt, knowing how to use them. And, um, you know, when things come along that you're like, oh, that would that would actually work really well with my tools because I know my tools inside and out. I know it works, what works with them, what doesn't. I can bring that on. I can bring that into the utility belt and utilize that for my drawings. Same, same with uh, painting as well. You know, you try out different brushes and stuff of that nature. That same principles apply. I just thought that was something good to add into that because I, I see quite a few people reaching for like whatever artists of the now that they follow is using and just put that into their pack and think that just using that is going to make them a great artist too which in fact it's just a familiarity and uh knowing the, the tools that you use which makes you a great artist well it doesn't make you a great artist but it helps <laughs> it's not the tools it's the artist but knowing the tools helps So I'm starting to put in a lot of my, um, the shirt that Av's wearing, it has these uh, lines, I guess, across them. This is the sort of design of the shirt. You would have seen that in the beginning. It has a sort of stripey design. So I'm, I'm bringing in those stripes by the flat of the charcoal 
and just pulling it across the paper in way in ways in which I see the lines come forth. I'm not doing it exactly because uh, I'm not interested in doing it exactly, but to the best part of of exactly as I can. Uh, that still just doesn't take away from the drawing. I just want to utilize those those lines to just emphasize that oh, this shirt has a pattern that um, you can see here. And it, it, I think they it, it comes out quite well in the end. I think I brush off some things and add some tone to different areas and stuff of that nature. But um, yeah, I, I'm really happy with uh, adding these lines in. I think they uh, they really add to the overall effect of oh, this this is not just a couple of lines indicating the shirt, but this shirt actually has uh, a place in space by adding these des this design onto it. So it's not just an empty void of a shirt with some value, but it's got a couple of nice, intricate, interesting patterns that I can throw on top of it, even though it's just stripes. Um, but yeah, there's just something to think about if your sitter has a sort of interesting shirt. Don't just, you know, go for the easy path and make it, oh, I'll just put it in a white shirt. There we go, she's wearing a white shirt. <laughs> or, or she's wearing a black shirt, there we go. Try try your hand in some adding some shapes, some patterns, some design into the shirt, and uh, see how that sort of helps the portrait maybe. I want to have a consistent sort of downward line to the background. I want that sort of weight of the background to always be falling onto Avalon. Uh, so that the viewer can see that these lines, these reading lines uh, sort of disappear in the, at that thick blackness of the uh, the sort of black bar at the top of Avalon's head uh, where the charcoal is thickest and read down into the shirt, read down into her face. So everything sort of this up-down sort of motion sort of feeling and then her face is the only thing that's out of that motion is it's 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 its own motion sort of uh, sort of way of uh, being and so that's something to think about when we're putting in the background there too is you know think about where is the motion going in in the background there is it going uh, side to side diagonally it's going up and down up and down usually is a bit more calmer uh, Diagonal is a bit more, uh, translates is a bit more um, powerful, a bit more aggressive. Um, and uh, I think swirls, something to do with swirls. I could, I, I kind of remember that. You're going to have to look that up. But <laughs> off the top of my head, something to do with swirls, something that happens as well. But yeah, that being said, up and down, a bit more calmer. Um, it's a bit more easier to read. You know, it doesn't take uh, a second glance really to have a look at it. It just adds to the portrait. So that's always a safe bet to add in some up down sort of background sort of lines. It's always nicer than just a solid block of color. So you can see that I've started to add those solid lines into my um into the shirt here as well. Not I'm not adding solid lines everywhere I can. I'm not I'm not outlining everything. I'm just putting some more gestural solid lines in here for readability and uh just sort of gesture, I suppose, that the shirt flows like this. Um the weight of the line really matters because you can see down at the bottom of the portrait there's that th sort of thick black line and then it disappears in the middle and then it reconnects again up next to Avalon's uh sort of neck. Um a good way to place these lines good rule of thumb is like where the shadows sort of sit is where you can sort of place these lines and where the light is sort of falling on it sort of let them disappear into it that's kind of how I always think about it um, if not uh, you can sort of just make it your own and, and, and think of okay this might look aesthetically pleasing or this might read better if I put in something here so you know play around with it think about it and work it out
sounds like they're in the Outback, right? Yeah. They have a pool too. Mm -hmm. You see the pool yeah, thing? Down, down the back? Mm -hmm. The pool's like the, right behind us. The, the, the neighbours have a pool. The people behind us, directly behind us, have a pool. Yeah. Wow, fuck, why is it so hard to say? So I'm starting to really add some more tone into the face now that everything around the face has become a lot more fleshed out, a lot more to where I want it to sit. Um, now I'm, I'm starting to get a lot more confident with uh, adding more value to the face, uh, fleshing out some more values in, in the eyes, especially uh, around the cheeks and, and in, the, in the shadow sort of area of the face. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a lot more confident in uh, being able to place those values. I know that I can place them and not have them too dark, or I can place them and not have them too light, now that I've worked out all the values around the face. And so, yeah, this is what the whole building up process uh, leads us to, is being able to make these confident uh, decisions uh, based on everything that we've been building. So it's really helpful. And obviously, using the pencil here to slowly build up that 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 uh that value um is definitely a key and i wouldn't really recommend just going in with a heavy charcoal hand although you, you know you can, you can definitely do that but like for th my approach here is a bit more um a bit more calculated a bit more uh just slow building is is the whole idea i suppose How soon after we build the house do you want to pull back? Do you want to get that little inflatable pool for them? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah? For a little bub to play in? Yeah. Alright. Well, you can do that. Pardon? You can see I'm really, really bouncing around the portrait. <laughs> well, around the face side of the portrait. Um, obviously, I'm bouncing around to the hair and everything as well. But um, I'm, I'm still, you know, if I'm not too sure about something, I'm, I'm, I'll just be like, okay, I'll leave that for now. I'll go on to something that I'm sure about in the portrait. Um, and so that's what I'm constantly doing. If I'm like, okay, I'm not too sure about that yet. Maybe I'll, I'll think about that while I build up some tone in some different areas of the portrait. Like you can see, I'm pulling some more value down into the uh, into the shirt now. You can see I'm pulling that right down into it. Um, so while I'm thinking about what to do with the face and where to put my marks and all those things, I can I can just put in some value into the into the shirt where I I know I want to put it. You know where I'm certain of where I want to put it while I uh, think about um, putting it elsewhere. 
I suppose that's just my excuse for saying that I don't stick on one spot for too long. <laughs> but no, it's 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 calculated. I swear. <laughs> So the nose is where I've chosen to start putting in some of those definite blacker marks because I'm happy with the way that the nose is proportioned, the way the nose is sitting. Um, so I'm very confident in being able to put these little black sort of indications that I want to put in there. Obviously, I'm not outlining the whole nose. The same with the way that I uh, put the marks on the blouse and do stuff like that. It's all for readability. It's all for aesthetics, I suppose. Um, you know, I'm not going to outline the whole shape of the nose with black. I'm just putting in where the nostrils sit because they'll be the blackest parts. Generally speaking, I just put a mark in that's a heavy mark. I'll put that in there where it's a really darker sort of point. So like the eyebrows, the uh, the the joining of the lips, the nostrils, um, the iris and stuff of that nature, the the eyelashes, um, so everywhere that you know that will be a definite black sort of mark, sort of sweep that in there. You can put a black mark into that. Building up the lips, it's interesting, you, you know, Building up the lips takes a lot of time to sort of understand. <clears throat> Building up the lips is kind of interesting because it takes a lot of time to understand that the lips is just, you know, it's a muscle in itself. And so it has different sort of planes to it, which don't, um, it's not just all one singular plane of, 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 of muscle. It, it has different ways. You know, we don't just smile in one single way. You know, we don't just talk um, with the same, like, sound all the time. Our lips are constantly making subtle changes uh, so that we can speak and so that we can convey emotion differently. And so, draw them in that way, you know, because they're not a solid object. No nothing really is. Everything's, a, you know, I guess, like, the your bones are a solid object, but even they have planes on them which light reflects around and stuff of that nature so yeah actually i've talked myself and <laughs> everything has planes and everything uh just moves uh as a plane so construct them as a plane uh, as they are you know as a plane that's having uh the light is falling on it in different ways and falling across it and over it just something to think about <laughs> 
while you uh, approach the construction of, I guess, anything, but most importantly, the lips, I find, especially for myself, was where uh, I'd lose a lot of my, um, I suppose, realism, in a sense. Realism would be lost a lot in the lips because I used to just do, like, a solid block of color or something of that nature. When the lips aren't, they have, you know, they move and, they, and they sh- they're shaped and have a very intricate shape in the way that light falls on them, falls in an intricate way. So you can see the the way that I'm approaching the face is still very, you know, building up, building up, building up. I'm I'm making those solid marks now and again, see in the lips and the nose, but I'm still just being really cautious, building up and building upon uh, my shapes and my values. Um, this is just kind of like, a you know, it's not a lack of confidence. It's not a lack of uh, not knowing where to put my things. It's just so that it's kind of like an insurance that, okay, I'll I'll slowly build this up. I'll slowly construct it because I want to get it right. I want to make it right. So the best way to do that is by slowly constructing it, by slowly building up the form. You know, a a sculptor doesn't just uh, bring a hammer to, to the marble block and just start smacking away at it. You know, he's, he's slowly chipping away, chipping away chipping away at the block until he's you know satisfied eventually many months later with what he's chipped away with (laughs) so the same the same uh ideas is present in the way that i draw as well i'm slowly sort of building the form slowly building it until i'm very happy with it and can make uh, marks where i want to make marks prominent good thing to note as well while we're in the face sort of aspect uh, the whole drawing the whole paint if you're painting if you're drawing everything constantly be checking of course but especially if we're doing a portrait and especially if we're doing the face of the portrait constantly be checking every just check 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 compared to your model compared to your reference whatever just check that you know the mark you're making is actually there on the model you know, and that you're not just putting down a mark for a mark's sake, that you're not just putting down a block of value for putting down a mindless block of value, because it is fun and it's a bit therapeutic to just put down just a mindless shading, mindless rendering stuff, but if it, but if it's not there on the model, then it's just a waste of time and you've kind of, you know, you've not captured what you've set out to capture. So just be really mindful even in this stage of just, you know, check, 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 you know, it's it's the old saying, you know, check twice, cut once, uh, instead of cutting cutting three times and only checking once. It's, it just saves you time. Just as a side note for anybody interested that uh, lives in Australia, <laughs> um, I will be running workshops again. Um, you would have seen this year in September, I had my first ever workshop. It's a beginner's oil painting workshop. I uh, went super well, super stoked with all that. Um, a gallery that I am going to, going to be a part of uh, was going to get a place that fell through um, so I, I, I had initially planned to do the next workshop with them in their new space, but that fell through, uh, because they didn't get that space. Well, 
they did get the space, but they didn't. There was some different little bits and pieces with that different space that just didn't end up working out. And so they dropped that, and now they're still looking for a space to be in. That's why I haven't been doing workshops is because I was waiting for uh, them to get a space. Uh, I will not be waiting um, too much longer because I'll be doing... I'm setting out to do... Uh, pro- definitely, there's going to be another beginner's oil painting workshop because a lot of people have asked me for that. Another workshops I want to do is some drawing orientated workshops. Uh, I want to do some portrait drawing workshops uh, that people can come along to and some figure drawing workshops, all of which will be in charcoal. Um, you know, beginners and 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 uh, uh, masters. I don't know what's the what's the in between thing. People that are used to doing something, <laughs> whatever that is. But it's not just for beginners. Let's put it that way. Um, but I will be able to instruct beginners there and uh, talk them through the process. People that have never held charcoal before, I will, I'll definitely be able to help you out with that if you come along to these um, workshops. So look out on my social medias uh, in the coming month uh, for announcements about those and, and where they're going to be held and wh- how to get tickets and stuff of that nature and what to bring and stuff. Uh, it'll all be detailed in those events. Um, other than the, the drawing workshops that I want to run, I want to run... I'm trying to work out a workshop for um plein air painting landscape painting type of type of workshop so i'm trying to i'm trying to work out that it's a it's interesting i guess the biggest thing would be that people will have to own a pochard box to go out on location and paint plein air with me um so that would probably be the biggest uh thing um but Thankfully, shard boxes uh, have become increasingly more accessible to people. You don't have to go to niche stores to find them, uh, plain air boxes or anything like that. You can just, you know, go down to your local uh, Eckersley or, or your Parkers and, and pick up a plain air painting box and uh, get get cracking into it. So that's something I really want to work with, with like some sort of plain air section and then inside the studio and, and maybe taking what you've, what you've painted on plain air up to a uh, fully rendered out painting. So that's a workshop I, I really want to start running. That I think that'd be fantastic. And then I want to have more consistent classes with uh, life drawing involved with that. And some more um, portrait painting workshops as well. So all of these I'm planning and will all come to fruition next year, 2020. So if you're not following me on my social media, such as Facebook, Instagram, uh, if you if you don't have my website, uh, or just look out. I think mainly Facebook, Instagram, YouTube uh, will be the th- main three where you'll be able to hear about those workshops when they're up. So follow me on those if you're interested in doing those workshops. Just thought I'd add that in here. So you can see I've really started to become a lot more confident in the mark making in the face. I've really started to bring forth the the definite definitive lines of of uh, Avalon's eyes, of her um, of her brows, of her eyelashes, and now of her literal eyes and eyeballs and her pupils and stuff of that. It it's uh just because we've been working up to it really <laughs> nothing much more than that you can say i i with the eyes themselves i start with a sort of a a sort of outline not as full outline of the entire eye but a sort of just a blocky sort of outline that doesn't really connect it it it, it allows for this more natural sort of feel to the eyes um, because the eyes aren't, you know, your eyes are perfectly like round and have that perfect round circle around them. But putting this sort of like disjointed round circle around it, um, I think looks really, really nice. Uh, and I, I like doing that. And just being careful with putting the pupil in there and putting in shadow in there too, so that I, um, I don't, I don't, um, just put a block of charcoal in there and I'm not able to put a pupil in there. Um, makes it really hard so just being careful with how much sort of shading I put in there around the pupil so that the pupil is sort of um, visible in a way because uh, your the color of your eye is never really going to be darker than your pupil because your pupil is just pure black um, so yeah 
That's a, something to just be careful on that. Otherwise, you just end up with these two black eyes sort of just piercing out. <laughs> so you just end up having to erase those things. <laughs> so yeah, be careful on those. Now that those eyes are in, I'm feeling really confident in being able to bring in the amount of uh, shadow and the amount of value into the face, into the, her her uh, shadows in her face. Um, just because now I'm like, okay, that is that is where my darkest dark is on the face. I will build up towards that, and that just helps me building up that that uh, that value there. The under part of the eye is actually something interesting. Uh, unless it's heavily, you know, got an eyeliner on it and something of that nature, you'll you'll never have a thick black line underneath the eye because the eyelashes there are kind of just shorter and a bit more spaced out than they are on top of the eye. So for that, you can sort of allow this uh, lineless sort of shape to appear underneath with little dots, uh, sort of little dash across underneath the eye to sort of sort of emphasize that, oh, the eye is sitting this way and that. But uh, generally, with the under part of the eye, a highlight works better than a darker line. So putting the highlight in there, um, generally, it, it sort of captures the essence of the under part of the eye a lot more and sits and looks more natural. And... Um, shading and, and bringing forth value in constructing the under part of the eye the sort of I guess where people would say the eye bag sort of area is um, sort of really helps uh, bring the shape of the eye into into a sort of realistic feel
Just a quick aside, I'm filming this entire process on my phone, on my smartphone, <laughs> as the boomers call it, uh, on my phone, it with a phone camera. It's it's really good. I, I really like it, and I think it's such a re- nice quality for what it is, and, and is able to record long periods of time um, without stopping. And uh, my main camera doesn't do that, um, and so it's just it's easier to work with. But I do plan on getting a camcorder type of thing, something with some optical zoom on it, a camcorder with some optical zoom, so that I can get into these um, when I'm getting into these more uh, refined stages of the of of the drawing of the painting or whatever, that I can sort of zoom it in cleanly and be able to give you those uh, those details. But until then, um, this is this is the best I can do with that. I just thought of something to add in there so that people are just sitting here going like, oh, why didn't he just zoom in? <laughs> but yeah. So that is a plan coming to. So now that we're at this part here in the process, you can definitely start to see the the likeness. You can start to see the resemblance. Everything sort of come together. Um, this is always the most rewarding part of the process is, is the last like stretch, the last hour, the last half hour, um, whatever it may be, the last stretch of the portrait, uh, of the painting, of the drawing, um, is always the most rewarding because you can start to see all your labor come to fruition and come to come manifest itself into this this work that was originally residing inside your head is now in the physical and it's in, it's before you and uh it's it's just really rewarding it's quite a um, it's quite a rush actually just to work towards that and then finally have this nice completed piece that you're really happy with um sitting in front of you uh, I, I think we still got a bit more work here to do, but um, just at this point, you know, everything's starting to come together. Bringing this up is because this is where you want to double down on your focus because it's really easy here to sort of put the pencil down and be like, oh, okay, okay, this is good enough. Uh, I'm done here. You know, when really your 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 work is about an hour or about 30 minutes from being a masterpiece, a masterpiece, and and you've just put it down there because you're like, oh, I'm I'm done, I'm done. Uh, stay, double down on your focus, you know, work it a bit more, you know, really, really bring it to a place where you're a hundred percent like happy with it. If not a hundred percent, ninety percent. If not ninety percent, you can probably settle for eighty five, but I wouldn't settle for anything less than eighty five percent happy with it. Um. Uh, in fact, I probably wouldn't settle for anything less than 90% happy with it. But the point being is is don't lose focus. Don't lose that drive. Don't lose that energy uh, just because you're on the final lap. Um, you know, people talk about that as uh, runners and marathon r- runners and, and people that are in races and that that nature. Um, you know, the, the, the fox and the hare. I mean, the hare and the tortoise sort of scenario, you know, the hare. He, he gets, you know, he's far ahead, he sees the finish line, he's just like, oh, well, I'm so far ahead, I'll just take a nap, and then he gets overlapped by the tortoise. You know, it's, it's those those uh, metaphors, those uh, stories teach us a lot of things. Same thing can be applied here when creating art. When it's in the final stages, don't just get lax with it, keep working it, and keep uh, building upon it, and keep that energy up. You know, we're about to finish up this work of labor 
you don't want to just flush all those those hours you just spent into the work down the toilet because you were you know just too lazy to bring to a finish that's why i always say that bringing an artwork to a finish is probably the hardest part you know starting a piece is 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 probably the easiest part when compared to where to finish a piece and so bring it to a 90 percent happy with it finish and i'm sure it'll look really great you know when you when you're feeling that urge to be like oh, i'm gonna put it down here just go that extra half hour go that extra hour and see where you can take it and see what more you can do with it or put it down and then come back to it tomorrow and give another hour into it and see where you can take it at that point and uh yeah and and really see if you can bring this this piece to a, to a complete finish in it yeah, it, it, saying that, people would say, oh, well, how do I know if it works finished or not? You you know by doing lots of works, really, where you're happy with it. Um, you gauge that by previous works. You gauge it by just doing works over time. And that's something you gotta be, you got to work out for yourself. I can't teach you that, uh, especially not in a video. I can't, I can't see your works, obviously. But know that, if you put that extra half hour, that hour, come back to it tomorrow, your work will generally speaking be better for it. So that's just something you're able to tell about your works um, after doing a lot, doing a lot of work, but doing a lot of practice with it. After creating a lot, you'll uh, it'll become a second nature sort of thing. You'll be like, okay, this is where I'm happy to put it down. This is where I'm happy. This is where I, what I envisioned. Um, this is something I'm happy with. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here. And, that, and like I said, comes about after working uh, portraits, working your works, doing your uh, paintings, drawings over a long period of time. This is something you pick up and becomes a sort of second instinct. Now that everything's sort of blocked in, I'm, I'm starting to get a lot more heavy-handed with my shading. Um, I'm starting to sort of, I can see different areas that I want to unify, and so I can do a, a, a light sort of shading over the top of them to sort of unify those areas and things of that nature. And so a lot of the rest of the work that goes into this next half an hour or what it, whatever it may be, um, is just into unifying the work, bringing everything so that it, it all sits together nice and easy so that everything doesn't look like it's squared off sections that I've done section by section or something like that but it all sits uh, comfortably and naturally all together and so that's sort of my thinking process as I sort of get to the end as, as well as that adding in these um, highlights adding in the final touches um, just say like with the hair uh, now you, I'll probably be adding in a lot of those uh, finer highlights with the with the eraser, with the brush, um, uh, with the erasers. I mean, not with the brush. I'll be adding in those nice highlights with the uh, more the uh, regular uh, thick eraser, um, the Faber Castell type of one. So it's like that solid eraser, more that more than the kneadable one. I'll be adding those highlights with it. I can. And you can see what those highlights do. Like, look at that, you know, just that real pop of highlight there. Just, it does it does everything really for the portrait. It, it, it unifies everything. And leaving these to last is, is such a gratifying thing when you do that. So that you're just able to make this the cherry on top, I suppose, of, 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 your, uh, of your drawing, of your painting or whatever. You can do it for both. 
but be, yeah, letting these highlights um, be the final sort of centerpiece of the of the work is uh something is 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 so good because it it really feels like the piece is coming to a finish. As I put in the background here, uh, uh, just as, just to mention, a lot of the, the rest of the process uh, going into the last, I think, ten minutes uh, of of the um, process, 
um, is really just uh, clean up, I guess you could say it as. It's just really clean up and refinement. That's all my mindset is right now. I'm really happy with everything. I'm really happy. There's no major changes I'm going to be making. There's nothing that I'm unsure of that are majorly. It's just a lot of clean up and, and refinement um, for the last like 10 minutes of, of this um, or 10 or 5 minutes of this um, drawing piece. So a lot of the uh, clean up and refinement has to do with like line works, values, uh, shading, and, and especially the background. I want to clean up the background a little bit more, uh, maybe add in some more highlights and stuff of that nature. But general um, going over the whole piece, checking what I want to change uh, with the reference photo there. Um, I can just look at that, look back here, and maybe just start to look at the piece as a whole more so uh, than looking at the uh, reference um, just just seeing how it sits as a drawing you know these are all my mindset this is all on my mind while I'm trying to uh, work the drawing here bring it to a finish um, so that's you know there's not much else to really uh, say about that uh, about that process that's the mindset that I take on when I'm when I'm at the end uh, when I feel like I'm getting close and I'm just I'm just trying to bring it all to a finish bring it to a, a do it to a nice clean uh, finish, unify everything, and uh, just sort of uh, cross my T's and dot my I's. Really, <laughs> is is the uh, is as the old saying says. Yeah. He's like, you're fucking kidding me. Yeah. Naturally. Yeah. I was like, you know. He's like, no, oh, they didn't fucking lay off, keep laying off everybody they fucking hired. They did what? They didn't keep fucking laying off everybody they fucking hired. Right. What a waste of time, it's like. Oh. Well, not like we were sitting here just waiting. Yeah, but, but I still would say you can't be waiting for that. Like, yeah, no, I was like trying to hurry up my food to get to this. <laughs> I don't know. Who thinks that? I think your eyes are bug eye looking. I don't look at that. My eyes do look bug eye though. No, you don't. No, you don't. You look, you look square on. Let's just fuck it up. It's just so hard to draw you with these fake eyelashes. It just looks translate to the drawing so unnaturally. I'm like, oh fuck. It just looks like I'm the one overemphasizing. Uh, yep.
And so, with that being said, I think that is uh, it for the drawing. And I'm really stoked with the outcome of this drawing. I'm really stoked with the process. Um, I'm, I'm really stoked with the entirety of this drawing. I'm really happy with the way that this drawing has unfolded. And I, I hope you are too. Um, so that's, this is the drawing as a finish. Remember when you're done with your drawings, put your name on it so people know who's done it, who's, whose work of art this belongs to, uh, so you let people know what's up. Thank you all so much for watching. I know it was a long video, but I'm sure that a lot of people out there got a lot of value from it. I personally really enjoy watching videos like this on YouTube. Uh, so something that I really like to watch. So I thought if I like to watch it, some other people might like to watch it also. So if you did like it, leave a comment down below. Even if you didn't like it, leave a comment down below as well. I'd like to hear feedback as well. Really fantastic to hear any sort of feedback. Um, so hit subscribe, hit that bell, get notified when I upload more. Other than that, I'll see you all in the next video.